Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Tracy Alexander. And coming up in today's newscast, the Israeli Prime Minister has a tax coming from all sides as he looks to push ahead with extending Israeli sovereignty over parts of Judea and Samaria, now saying it will happen in stages. A controversial coronavirus bill is softened as it moves through the next stage of deliberation. And the Palestinian suspect accused of killing an Israeli soldier with a brick last month confesses to the crime. Opposing positions from every angle causing difficulties for the Israeli Prime Minister as he looks to advance Israel's sovereignty over parts of Judea and Samaria. The latest extreme far-right Israeli activists launching a campaign in a bid to foil the United States peace plan. Organisers of the It's All Ours movement say they will establish outposts in parts of Judea and Samaria earmarked for the proposed Palestinian state should the Peace for Prosperity plan be implemented. This morning, Palestinians in Asawi are waking up to discover their town had been targeted in an apparent hate crime. Twelve cars vandalised and Hebrew graffiti spray-painted on the wall of a home with the Star of David and the phrase, The Nation of Israel Lives. This after net Yahoo delivered some difficult news to the Jewish settlement leaders overnight. Here's more. Israeli settler heads at the centre of the pushback, being told by the Israeli Prime Minister overnight, Judea and Samaria annexation plans are moving forward, but only partially. July 1 is the earliest possible date allowed by the Premier's coalition deals. But settler heads are reportedly being told that extending Israeli sovereignty over the full portion of lands allocated to Israel under Trump's peace plan will happen in stages. So what do these comments mean? Should the July 1 Knesset vote achieve the expected majority, well, the government would initially extend sovereignty over about 3% of Judea and Samaria, home to some 450,000 Israelis from some 132 settlements. And what does that mean for the remainder of the roughly 30% that the Trump deal grants to Israel? Well, it would be taken by Israel at a later period. That's once the Joint U.S.-Israel Mapping Committee finishes working out the exact territorial divisions beyond the pre-1967 Green Line. Sunday's sit-down comes amid reports the United States Mideast peace team wants to slow the pace of Israel's unilateral move as it's consumed with domestic crises of its own. And tensions are high. Also today, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu filing the third complaint to police for incitement to murder him and his wife. This as right-wing factions push back against the government's plan to begin extending its sovereignty over Judea and Samaria. But how do other Israelis feel? Well, according to a survey by the left-wing Geneva Initiative Group, more Israelis oppose the move than support it. The opinion poll showing that just under 42% of the public aren't for it, compared with over 32% that are, but only 3.5% listed as among their top priorities. Now, ILTV took to the streets to get a broader picture of the sentiment. Take a look. <laughs> I think it's uh, going to cause a lot of trouble. אני חושב שזו החלטה נכונה, אמיצה, הגיעה בזמן, הרבה אנשים גרים ביהודה ושומרון, הגיע הזמן באמת שתהיה להם הכרה מלאה, בדיוק כמו כל אחד שגר בישראל. Now joining me to discuss this multi-side conversation around the issue, ABC News correspondent Jordana Miller. Jordana, great to have you with us. Now, Left-wing opposition to a move like this, we know, is nothing new. But right-wing opposition, it's, this is the time that they're making things difficult. What is Netanyahu considering here? Well, it's true. We're not used to seeing right-wing uh, you know, proponents and supporters of the prime minister against the idea of annexation or extending Israeli sovereignty over the West Bank. But here's why they're against the plan, uh, Tracy, and that's because 
if Israel annexes up to 30 percent of the West Bank, President Trump's peace plan calls for the rest of that area to eventually one day become a Palestinian state. And it also leaves out about 15 settlements uh, and imposes a kind of settlement freeze, mm. uh, a building freeze in the other existing settlement block. So that's why uh, there is a growing kind of faction within the right wing that is uh, against this plan and saying, mm. you know, for the prime minister, very troubling things about the American president who Netanyahu sees as uh, having been such a strong ally. Now, it's absolutely unclear, Tracy, exactly what Netanyahu is going to do. He has kept the cards of this annexation plan very close to his chest. We can say that even some of the top defense officials in the country don't know exactly what he's planning, which uh, it seems curious given that the Israeli army is going to have to defend new territory. So mm. we don't know exactly uh, what he's going to do, but it does seem that the timeline for it, though it may begin in July, uh, the actual details and the move may not come until later, perhaps August, September. And there's a lot of factors here, not only Netanyahu, uh, what is in his political interest, but also what's in the White House's political interest. They do want to see some move. They think it'll help their uh, evangelical base. Uh, and Netanyahu wants to do it quickly because there are signs that perhaps President Trump will not win re-election in November. No doubt. And we have seen at least uh, Benjamin Netanyahu trying to appeal to the settler leaders, telling them that he, he wouldn't even consider the remainder of Judea and Samaria to be a, a Palestinian state. Uh, but the US is reportedly asking Netanyahu, of course, to slow down with his push ahead of July 1. We've seen uh, they have bigger fish to fry domestically. So what's Netanyahu juggling now with the United States? What will they allow? Right. Well, that's the uh, that's the big question. And it's really interesting to see that, you know, one of the main uh, influencing factors in this whole annex annexation question is the White House. Uh, they have a lot at stake here and they are incredibly preoccupied right now to use uh, perhaps uh, the most uh, neutral word uh, with a failing economy, the COVID-19 infection still soaring uh, across the country. And now uh, these very difficult uh, race relations uh, that have led to violent protests across the country. So the White House has indicated, we know from leaked Israeli reports, that they want Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to slow down because, of course, this could have major consequences around the region. Mm. And if it unleashes violence, that will be a problem for the White House. It looks like they want to wait as close to November as they can. And in terms of internal uh, reactions, Jordana, the protests in Israel we saw this week against the plan move with some strong images uh, waving Palestinian and communist flags. How are anal analysts uh, digesting this? That's right. I mean, when we look at what's happened here in the last week or so, uh, we see that the left wing camp is really kind of riding the wave of this global movement against racism, discrimination. The Israelis interpreting it in one protest over the weekend against annexation in the name of George Floyd, that African-American killed at the hands of American policemen. Um, but we have to say, uh, Tracy, the numbers just don't, they're, they're not very strong. We saw maybe 6,000 Israelis come out. The left wing and peace camp is still relatively weak here, and it doesn't feel like they're going to have a major influence over the decision about annexation. It's going to come more from the politicians, possibly from the opposition, the uh, alternate prime minister, General Benny Gantz, or the Americans. All right, Jordana Miller, thank you so much for that analysis and that insight. Thanks, Tracy. Education and transportation. These are the major issues next to be weighed by a special coronavirus cabinet in Israel after that coronavirus law progressed to the next stage of bureaucracy. The contentious bill being discussed today would grant the government and police extensive powers, but some controversial clauses have already been scrapped. Nitney Manson has the story. The warnings have been increasing, and this week it's no different. <laughs> The Israeli Prime Minister's stern warning foreshadowing the expected government approval of the controversial so-called coronavirus law, up for ministerial review today. 
The death toll continues to rise with three more fatalities reported Sunday evening, bringing the numbers to 298. That's seven deaths since Friday. While it's schools that have been the epicenter of the recent spike in infection cases, one change. Tel Aviv has seen more cases in the past three days than Jerusalem, which has until now seen the bulk of the spread. Amidst fears of a second wave of the pandemic, Israel's national airline carrier announcing it will extend its ongoing suspension in regular passenger service until at least the end of the month. Under the new legislation likely to be passed, the government would be given special powers to deal with COVID-19 for 45 days. It would be able to extend the emergency period every 30 days for up to 10 months. Outrage sparked over a former version of the legislation which allowed police to enter homes with no warrant is now absent from the softened bill. It does, though, allow the government to apply lockdowns and to order people into quarantine, as well as giving police power to disperse public gatherings under the threat of fines or even prison sentences. Businesses will close down if they don't heed social distancing orders, and neighborhoods can be declared restriction zones for up to a week, also liable to an extension. Defense Minister Benny Gantz taking to Facebook to say that individual liberties will be protected. Moving on now, Israel's political leaders are applauding a breakthrough in the case of an Israeli soldier fatally struck with a brick near the Palestinian city of Jenin. The country's security brass announcing the suspected killer has confessed. Here's more. Justice is set to be served after the killing of an Israeli soldier during a raid of Judea and Samaria last month. Sergeant First Class Amit Benigal was fatally struck by a brick thrown from the roof of a three-storey building in the northern West Bank village of Yabed. Close to a month after the May 12 incident, the Israeli military and Shin Bet security agency confirming the arrest of a suspect taken in for questioning the day of the attack. <laughs> נתתי הנחיה להרוס את ביתו של המרצח הזה. מי שמנסה לפגוע בנו, ידינו משגת אותו. במוקדם ומאוחר, בשנים האחרונות, אתם רואים שזה במוקדם. The suspect is 49-year-old Nazmi Abu Bakar, a resident of Yabed who lives in the building from which the rock was thrown. The Shin Bet saying he was one of several suspects accused, but in recent days confessed to the crime. Charges have not been filed by the military prosecutor. This as Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu issues an apology for the police killing of 32-year-old East Jerusalem man Iyad Khalak on May 30. In Yad al-Khalak, it's a tragedy. אדם עם מגבלויות, עם אוטיזם, שנחשד, אנחנו יודעים, שלא בצדק, בהיותו מחבל, במקום מאוד רגיש, אני יודע שאתם עושים את הבדיקות, אבל כולנו משתתפים בצערה של המשפחה, אני חושב שזה חובק את הציבור הישראלי כולו, וגם את ממשלת ישראל כולה. מצפה לבדיקות המלאות שלכם בעניין הזה. כמובן שזה לא מצדיק את ההתנפלות ה... A guilty plea today by a Palestinian man for the rape and murder of Israeli teenager Ori Ansbacher in an incident Israel regards as terror. 19-year-old Ansbacher from the Jewish settlement of Tekoa was fatally attacked and violated in a Jerusalem forest in February 2019. Arafat Irfea pleading guilty at the Jerusalem District Court to charges of first-degree murder, rape and unlawful killing with a terror motivation. Irfea from the West Bank reportedly telling investigators he did not plan much of the attack besides buying a kippah so that he could slip into Israel undetected, choosing a Jewish victim so he could be a mother. He will be sentenced at a later date. Well, if we haven't heard it in the news, we're aware of it on social media because the issue of racial equality has been brought straight into our feeds. It might have started in America, but now countries the world over are reflecting on racism in their own backyards. Jerusalem yesterday becoming the second Israeli city to demonstrate after Tel Aviv last week. Elsewhere on the streets, we're seeing protests across the globe from Hollywood to London and Berlin, Paris and cities across Italy. In Australia, we're seeing signs reading same story, different soil. But as the dialogue about equality is had under the banner of Black Lives Matter, 
The conversation is taking on a different tone by some Jews, Israelis or pro-Israel supporters denouncing BLM.org ties to anti-Israel sentiment. One woman who moved to Israel from the US four years ago has been having conversations about this topic here in the Holy Land and Chaya Lev joins me now in the studio. Chaya, a pleasure to have you with us. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. Of course. Now, yeah. it's a tough issue. There are a lot of shades of grey here, particularly around the issue here in Israel mm -hmm. and among Jewish people. But you're in a unique position to discuss mm -hmm. this issue, being a black Jewish woman from mm -hmm. America now living in Israel. Oh. What does the Black Lives <laughs> Matter movement mean to you? Um, when I personally hear Black Lives Matter, um, first I think, wow, it's so significant that I have to say to someone that my life as a black life matters. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's me saying I've seen over the years from the time my people were enslaved 400 years ago to Jim Crow laws to the murder of Emmett Till. There's just been so much Trayvon Martin. And many of us in the black community are saying we're not treated like we matter. So we say our lives matter mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. too. The it's not too. over anybody. It's not a competition on mm -hmm. whose life is better. Mm -hmm. It's our lives matter too. Mm -hmm. It's something that we're having to talk to our children about. Right. So it's it's like a statement. Right, but you say black lives matter too, and then you'll hear the retort, Jews' lives matter too, because they share in that feeling of, of persecution since uh, the dawn of time, some would argue. So how do you reconcile the two, knowing that the BLM.org movement uh, you know, harbors anti-Israel sentiment by some of those members? Well, first I'd like to say I don't know much about the BLMmovement.org, the Black Lives Matter movement.org, because when I say Black Lives Matter, I'm not part of an organization other than wanting people to not erase me. When I say Black Lives Matter and you come behind me, all lives matter, you're erasing what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know much about that movement in general, so I can't really rectify something I don't know much about. What I want people to do is just understand that I want them to see me as a black life that's also important to society. Because mm -hmm. for many years, based on American you know, history, we were property. We were chattled in you know, by way of slavery. We weren't looked at as a life. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's something that was on the books three -fifth of a, that we were three-fifths of a human. So we're saying we're not property anymore. Mm -hmm. We are lives, mm -hmm. and we matter. We want to be part of this. We want to be at the table as well. We want to be treated fairly. Right, but then one That's also it. sees, I mean, from, the, from those people uh, that, that, that identify as Jewish, and they understand that those in the BLM.org movement harbor some anti Israel and anti-Jewish sentiment. Uh, how do you invite these people to be able to come to the table and support the Black Lives Matter 2 movement when they feel that perhaps by supporting that they feel like you know their beliefs are under threat? I think that they should read um, look like what I've done at the um, internet, Google, which is very out there for all of us, and understand that when you say Jewish, you have to understand that there are some black Jews out there. We're in there too. So when you're saying Jewish lives matter, you may very much be talking about me as well. Mm -hmm. So I think the research and not just believing everything you hear mm -hmm. is like important. And you've been having these conversations with people oh, here sure. in Israel. So what have people shared with you about the dissonance between the Jews lives matter feeling versus the black lives matter feeling, although it shouldn't be a one versus yeah, the other? Yeah, it shouldn't be one. It's mm. not a competition. I'm very pro-Israel. This is why I moved here. I'm, I, I love Israel, 100,000%. I support Israel. Um, but also, I live in Israel, but I have family that lives in America. So I have to maintain that we're just as important. And even if I wasn't black, mm -hmm. I would still be saying, mm -hmm. Those people are just as important. Right, but when you're speaking to, say, Jewish people that live in Israel here, what are they sharing with you about this issue? Honestly, to be completely honest, um, people in Israel have been really open and honest and asking me questions. It's Jews in America that I'm hearing, or American Jews in Israel, but when I'm talking to Israelis, they're going, we understand, we get it, we see your pain, we see what's going on in the streets. We see why you have to say that. The fact that you even have to say that you matter, mm. That's, yeah. that's more of the question that we should the, be talking about. Anyone has to say their matter is, of course, the shame. Hi, thank you so much for coming thank and sharing you. that, your personal you story. You're in a really me. unique position to shed uh, light on this issue. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Well, today is World Oceans Day and Israel is on board with the mission to clean up the coastline. It's all about raising awareness around the importance of maintaining the habitat of marine creatures. And one ecological organisation helping out locally is Plastic Free Israel. The organisation's co-directors Ariel Shea and Evelyn Anker join me in studio. Ladies, great to have you with us. Thank you so much for having Now, you have gotten out well in front. You started your Clean Up, uh, clean up Israel uh, activities on Friday on the beaches of Tel Aviv. Tell us more. Um, so we're doing monthly beach cleanups with Plastic Free Israel. The idea is to clean the beach and prevent the trash from uh, reaching the ocean. Uh, we're also raising awareness and teaching the people about plastic pollution, collaborating and promoting businesses that offer alternatives to single-use plastics. And um, Last Friday, we celebrated World Oceans Day. We collaborated with Acharai and Trash Tag from IDC in a Trash Talk event. The idea is to create um, a fun and positive uh, beach cleaning experience where they pay with bags full of trash for food, drinks, uh, activities, and, uh, and more, and everything is from donations. What an incredible initiative. But tell me first how uh, uh, Plastic Free Israel began. Why did you see it as such a critical need here? Uh, so our friend Stav actually started it um, and we are we kind of took it over from her um, when she left the country but um, she basically she moved to Israel for a, a set period of time um, and she saw the excessive amount of single-use plastic that's used in the country today still mm -hmm. um, and that people were littering on beaches or just in, in you know nature without kind of seeing the the connection to like their usage and the pollution problem. Right. Um, so she set up a beach cleanup, just publicized it on Facebook. Evelyn right. was one of the first volunteers who showed up. <laughs> Incredible. Yeah. In and fact, I've actually been to uh, one of the beach cleanups. Okay. And awesome. it's actually concerning to see not only the big pieces of plastic, but we're talking about the microplastics in the water, which are the parts that we don't see that are really harmful to the marine creatures. But when we've been looking at coronavirus, we've been hearing a lot from people about how our skies are, are clearing up and same with our oceans. Talk us through the impact that coronavirus has had uh, on the environment and on our marine uh, life. I think it's really promising that we're seeing like nature kind of recover in the period of time in which humans weren't going outside as much. Yeah. Um, but I do think that because of coronavirus, we are relying on that single-use plastic more. Mm. Uh, we're seeing a lot of masks and gloves discarded. Mm. Um, and also, there's been this perception that we've noticed in Israel where there's a belief that single-use plastic is actually more hygienic or clean. Mm -hmm. But in reality, we don't know where that comes from. When we take a cup from you know a doctor's office or wherever we are, that could have been sitting there. We don't know who that was exposed to. So actually, right. using reusable is the better, yeah. cleaner option mm. uh, yeah. because you're in control of how much you wash it, when it was washed, who it's with. Certainly. Um, and if any of our viewers want to reduce the amount of single-use plastics that they're using every day, what, what can they do? Um, I think the first thing to do is to change consumption habit, to use or what you have already and not buy everything new. Mm -hmm. uh, start changing to reusables and when, you, when you're done with the things that you already have, think about eco-friendly materials that are sustainable and are not single-use. Focus on reusable and and it's really important to remember that you don't have to be perfect about it. It's a process mm -hmm. and um, everything you do is important. Absolutely. Each time that you can prevent the use of single-use plastic is a win, right? Yes, yes, definitely. Well, Ariel, Evelyn, thank you so much for being here for the work that you're doing. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. All right, well, on that note, let's take a look at the weather forecast. Down south in Eilat, it's a steamy evening with a low of 80 degrees Fahrenheit tonight. That's 27 degrees Celsius. Tomorrow, another sweltering day with a top of 104 degrees Fahrenheit or 40 degrees Celsius. In Tel Aviv tomorrow, it's a top of 85 degrees Fahrenheit and 29 degrees Celsius. And now, before we go, let's take a look at what's going viral in Israel. Absolutely incredible. What I'm most impressed by, oh my goodness, I only just realized that those dogs <laughs> inside inflatable cars, I had no idea what was chasing that poor little puppy. All right, well, that is it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.47 shekels to the American dollar. Sorry, I'm still laughing at that. For more news from ILTV, please, take, uh, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube and Roku TV pages. I'm Tracy Alexander, and thank you so much for watching.